Good afternoon. Uh, just one element at the top today. A Russian court has sentenced Jehovah's Witness Alexander Evshin to seven and a half years in prison for his religious practice, marking a new record-length sentence for a Jehovah's Witness for one's religious belief. The United States condemns Russia's continued crackdown on Jehovah's Witnesses and other peaceful religious minorities in the strongest possible terms. The United States affirms that as a matter of human rights, all people are entitled to believe or not to believe according to the dictates of their own conscience. Uh, so with that, um, Matt, do you want to take it over? Uh, yeah. Um, so I've got a bunch of sanctions questions, but they're on different countries. So I'll just start with one, let, and then we can move on, and I'll try to come back to the others. And, um, uh, first, on Yemen, um, I was not here yesterday. I'm sure you, you missed me. Um, but uh, I understand that during the during the briefing, you uh, mentioned that the leaders of the Houthis had not actually been removed from all uh, sanctions; that they still that they are still sanctioned under some, uh, some under under some authorities, and that the uh, the removal of the FTO designation did, did, did not affect those. So I'm I'm just wondering, given the fact that the Houthis seem to have stepped up their activity, their offensive, uh, their offensive operations uh, in Yemen, in which critics of this administration say is a response to your removal or is somehow related to that. Why, why did you, why, why did you remove these, this one layer of sanctions and then uh, leave the other on? Because it seems that they're still impacted by sanctions. Sure. Uh, well, Matt, we covered this at, at some length yesterday, but let me just reiterate uh, what we discussed. Uh, you heard from the secretary himself when he was standing right here, I believe it was two weeks ago to the day, uh, when he was asked about his priorities for the areas uh, that he wanted to review on um, an exigent basis. Uh, and he raised uh, the Houthi designation, the designation of Ansrallah uh, as uh, a broad movement. Uh, and he said um, uh, very clearly uh, that the United States, as do bipartisan members of Congress, as do the United Nations, as do humanitarian aid organizations, that we had profound concerns about the implications of that broad designation for the people of Yemen. Yemen, now home to the world's worst humanitarian catastrophe, noting, as I believe the secretary did at the time, that some 80% of Yemen's civilians live under Houthi control. Um, when the secretary, and we confirmed this on, on Friday, uh, when he uh, communicated to Congress his intent to remove uh, the designation of Ansrallah as a broad movement, uh, we made very clear that it has nothing to do with our view of the Houthis uh, and their reprehensible conduct. Uh, we spoke forcefully um, and in no uncertain terms about their attacks on our partner, Saudi Arabia, which, as you alluded to, have continued, uh, their kidnapping of American citizens, their malign influence uh, throughout the region. Uh, we reiterated that um, the intent the secretary has communicated to revoke this broad uh, umbrella designation uh, instead is about those humanitarian implications. Uh, the fact that as a country, um, we do not want to do anything uh, that would uh, worsen the plight of the millions of Yemenis who live under uh, Houthi control. And again, it was the considered assessment of bipartisan members of the Hill the United Nations, uh, various humanitarian aid organizations, that a broad designation uh, would do uh, just that. And so that's why yesterday I went to um, some links in explaining that just as we remove, just as the secretary has an intent to remove that broad designation, we will continue to keep up the pressure on the Houthis. If the Houthi leadership is under any illusion uh, that the intent to revoke uh, this designation suggests that we are going to let up the pressure on them, they are sorely mistaken. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that we continue, and you alluded to this, um, have designations on the Houthi leadership. Ansrala leaders Abdul Malik al-Houthi, Abdul Khalik Badr al-Din al-Houthi, and Abdul Yahya al-Hakim, 
they all remain designated under both UN sanctions uh, and are sanctioned under Executive Order 13611, uh, which is related to uh, acts that threaten the peace, security, or the stability of Yemen. Our goal, as we have said, and as a president, in fact, alluded to uh, last week when he was here, um, our goal is, uh, in the first instance, uh, to support the diplomatic process, uh, to move that forward under the auspices of the uh, UN uh, Special Envoy, Martin Griffiths. Um, our goal uh, and our plan is to help uh, our Saudi partners uh, defend themselves. Um, uh, and just as we take prudent steps like this, or intend to take prudent steps like this, uh, to um, uh, alleviate, uh, or at least not worsen, uh, the suffering of uh, the Yemeni civilians uh, who live under Houthi control. So, in fact, there is no change to any sanctions on these individuals. There is no change. So, uh, what was the, so you know, what, 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 was, what was the point? Then? Well, I just spent, I think, five minutes explaining it. Uh, the, the point was to, uh, the intent was to revoke the broad designation that has profound, steep, uh, and precarious humanitarian implications for the people of Yemen. We are distinguishing between the people of Yemen uh, and the Houthi leadership. Right. Yeah, well, you know what? Various U.S. administrations, I've covered a bunch of them now, have always said that there's a distinction between the people and the government or the people and the leadership or the people and the rebel organization, whatever. But, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that there was no – Is there was there any practical effect – of of. Removing the FTO designation and the, and 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 the, and the terrorism designation. So the terrorism to, designation to be clear, will. the secretary on Friday communicated his intent to revoke. Uh, the uh, yeah, we'll as, get to that in two seconds. As I said, uh, I believe it was a couple days ago. Now, uh, our process and our orientation is to get back to regular order. Uh, that includes regular order when it comes to our uh, communication, our dialogue, our consultations with members of Congress. Members of Congress have a prerogative uh, to be informed, uh, to, um, uh, um, uh, to be in the know when it comes to these intents. Um, and that, of course, is why okay. we notified the them last, ahead of time. Uh, la la last one on this. So this revocation, these revocations took effect today with a publication in the Federal Register. Okay. I, uh, I don't know if you do every morning, but I do. It's very exciting. Go through the Federal Register and look to see what's going on. It's 260 pages today. The only two notices that are in the Federal Register that there is no link to, in other words, you can't click on it, you can't see what it, the document actually is, are these two revocations. Yes, uh, and I can explain that. Um, uh, really? I can. Uh, okay. Uh, in fact, Matt, what you saw was not a revocation, a formal revocation. It was, uh, unfortunately, an administrative error. Uh, the Federal Register uh, notice pre-published prior to the conclusion of the congressional notification uh, required for the revocation of the FT FTO designations. Uh, so the designation does, in fact, uh, remain in place. So, okay. So the notice that was sent up to the Hill or put into, into the SCIF, even though it's not classified, but it was still put into a skiff that was sent to the uh, SFRC and others. It, so, in fact, the FTO designation has not yet been revoked. The congressional review period is ongoing. So it has not. So it has, it has not. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, changing topic. Okay. okay. The Palestinian Israeli issue. Uh, Ned, the Israeli press is saying that Israel is aiming to pressure you guys to tie whatever restoration or resumption of talks with the Palestinians or relations or aid or anything to them committing themselves to refraining from going to the ICC. Is that, is that what's going on? I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that once more? Yes. Uh, condition resumption of relations and aid to the Palestinians to them refraining from going to the ICC. Uh, look, we have spoken uh, here before um, about our uh, intent uh, uh, about our intent to provide assistance uh, to the benefit of all uh, Palestinians, including to Palestinian refugees. Um, we are in the process of determining uh, how to move forward uh, with the resumption of that assistance, uh, consistent with U.S. law, consistent with our interests. Right, but you're not going to make that contingent on them refraining publicly from going to the... We are going to make it uh, contingent uh, on our values and our interests. Uh, just a couple more, if you would uh, indulge me. The Secretary of State uh, said Monday, mm -hmm. when he, uh, on his interview with CNN, 
uh, that he asked, actually, he appealed to both sides not to take any unilateral mm -hmm. measures that may, you know, hinder whatever process may go on. Today, uh, the Israeli press is also reporting that the Jewish National Fund is set to approve a new policy on Sunday that will allow the organization to officially purchase land in the West Bank for potential expansion. Now, this did not happen in the past, and the U.S. has looked, you know, not too kindly on such an effort. Mm -hmm. What would be your reaction if this happened? Well, I think there's a broad point at play here, and that point is this. We believe it is critical uh, to uh, refrain from unilateral steps uh, that exacerbate tensions and that undercut efforts uh, to advance a negotiated two-state solution. solution. Mm -hmm. uh, and unilateral, unilateral steps might include uh, annexation of, te of territory, uh, settlement activity, uh, demolitions, incitement to violence, provi the provision of compensation for individuals uh, imprisoned for acts of terrorism. Um, we uh, have continued um, to emphasize um, that it is critical to refrain from all of those activities. Last one, really quick. Now, uh, also the Secretary of State, you know, did not respond to a question on East Jerusalem. Now, if you are calling for a two-state solution, there seems to be an international consensus that if the Palestinians are to have their state and to have a capital for that state, it will be in East Jerusalem. So why, why would the Secretary sort of refrain and say, this is, we must leave this to final status issues and so on? Well, this has been uh, the longstanding policy of the United States, and I think this is what the Secretary was referring to. Uh, the ultimate status of Jerusalem is, in fact, a final status issue, uh, which will need to be resolved uh, by the parties in the context of direct negotiations. That, uh, that is not a change to longstanding policy. The previous Secretary of State um, issued guidance saying that he does not think that uh, Israeli settlements in the West Bank or other Palestinian land are, um, are legal under international law. Mm -hmm. Is that still the policy of this administration? Do you still abide by that guidance? Has the guidance been revised or is it being reviewed? We abide by the principle uh, that I just uh, uh, invoked in response to Saeed's question. We believe it's critical um, for Israel and the Palestinian Authority to refrain from unilater unilateral steps that exacerbate tensions uh, and undercut efforts to advance a negotiated two-state solution. So there has been no change in the Secretary's revocation of the Hansel Memorandum? Uh, that... What we have said? Um, no, no, no uh, I don't want to know what you have said. I want to know whether the, the, there's been a change in that, because it was a big deal when he when, when, when he basically said that that is no longer the, um, the policy of, of the United States. What we have said, um, and this is the principle that is at play, uh, is that we encourage Israel and the Palestinians to avoid unilateral steps uh, that put the prospects of a two-state solution also, Does that mean then that there has been no change in, in the previous administration's decision on passport, uh, uh, on using uh, Jerusalem, comma, Israel? We have no changes to announce uh, to the current guidance on passports. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, the first one is about Cuba. I know the government is currently reviewing the policy mm -hmm. towards Cuba, but so far, has the new administration found any evidence that the Cuban government was responsible behind the attacks in the embassy in La Habana? And also, what is the Biden administration doing to find out what was the cause of those attacks? Great. Um, well, I appreciate uh, the question. And I would start by saying that, uh, and it's something I've said here before, is that, uh, of course, we have no higher priority. Uh, than the safety and the security of U.S. personnel, uh, their families, other U.S. citizens, uh, both, of course, in this country and around the world. Uh, the U.S. government is working to determine what happened to our staff and their families uh, and to ensure the well-being and health of our officials uh, going forward. That investigation remains underway. It remains a high priority. And I can tell you uh, that during the transition period, this was one of the first uh, briefings, comprehensive briefings, that as Secretary-designate at the time, Secretary-designate Blinken requested uh, of uh, the transition team. Uh, and he has, in fact, received updates uh, during his time uh, as Secretary of State. Uh, he has made clear that this is a priority for him, uh, and those uh, updates will uh, continue going forward. Um, what I can also say is that uh, and uh, the department established an interagency task force uh, to coordinate uh, the government's response to these incidents in May of 2018. 
more recently, and in fact just this week, uh, to reassert the department's leadership and responsibility for U.S. government personnel overseas. Uh, we elevated, as I said, this week, uh, the coordinator role to a senior level position so that a high level official will be empowered to advise senior department leadership, coordinate the department's interagency response to the health security incidents, and to provide continuing um, uh, support to affected personnel. Uh, this advisor uh, will be positioned in a senior role and will report uh, directly to the department's senior leadership to ensure, as I said, that we continue to make significant strides uh, to address this issue and to ensure our people are receiving the treatment they need. Um, we'll have additional details uh, on this new role in the coming days, I would expect. And my second question was about uh, Colombia. Well. If you're worried about the rising number of human rights defenders who are being murdered, Human Rights Watch put a, yesterday a report out. And if you think that uh, Ivan Duque's government is doing enough? Well, we have seen the Human Rights Watch report that you alluded to. Uh, we are concerned uh, about ongoing uh, violence against human, right def human rights defenders uh, who play a vital role in building a just and lasting peace uh, in Colombia. Uh, reducing this violence and prosecuting these crimes uh, is a top priority for both the United States and Colombia, uh, and it's an issue we raise with the Colombian government. Uh, it is crucial to recognize that those responsible for these brutal killings, the illegal, uh, non-state armed groups and narco-terrorists uh, who wreak havoc on parts of the Colombian countryside. Uh, we are proud to partner uh, with the Colombian government, security services, uh, and civil society to strengthen human rights protections uh, and rural security, and to fight the narcotics trafficking groups that drive this violence. And just a follow-up on this, uh, you just mentioned that the Biden administration raised this government, uh, sorry, raised this issue with the government of Colombia. When was that? And who was involved in those conversations? Uh, so human rights uh, are an issue that uh, that we raise routinely um, with our uh, partners, with our allies. It is a staple uh, of our conversations, uh, whether it's the Secretary of State, uh, whether it's the President of the United States, uh, whether it is any other uh, senior U.S. government uh, official. Uh, you have seen this reflected uh, in the readouts that we have issued uh, at last count this morning, and I think this tally needs to be updated. The Secretary of State has had 42 calls um, with uh, his counterparts uh, around the world. Uh, the President of the United States continues to make uh, uh, calls and to have discussions with his counterparts around the world. Uh, this is something that uh, will continue to be at the center of those conversations uh, at all levels, including the most senior ones. Yes. Gita with Voice of America. Great. I have a couple of, uh, a number of questions on China. Okay. As you know, President Biden spoke with his Chinese counterpart last night, mm -hmm. and then the White House uh, put out a statement saying that, and I quote, uh, President Biden underscored his fundamental concerns mm -hmm. about Beijing's coercive and unfair economic practices, mm -hmm. crackdown in Hong Kong, human rights abuses in Xinjiang, and increasingly assertive actions in the region, including Taiwan. Mm -hmm. From the other side, China has said that the two sides agreed to keep uh, in close contact on issues of mutual concern and also asked uh, the two countries to reestablish a dialogue mechanism. Mm -hmm. Now, is the old bilateral U.S.-China strategic and economic dialogue uh, officially dead, or is the administration looking to a new format of dialogue? Well, we don't have any um, uh, upcoming engagements uh, to announce at, at present. Uh, I know I'm the one who normally uh, uh, answers the questions, but can I ask you a question? Do you have the readout in front of you? Can you read the last line of, of the readout? Um, that uh, President, well, not the entire thing, but President Biden underscored his fundamental concerns about Beijing's coercive and unfair economic practices, crackdown in Hong Kong, human rights abuses in Xinjiang, and increasingly assertive actions in the region, including towards Taiwan. Well, there's a final sentence there um, in that readout from last night that I think really helps to contextualize uh, what our posture is towards uh, Beijing. Uh, and it made very clear um, that even though uh, the readout uh, broadly made clear that even though we see this relationship through the lens of competition uh, and uh, our broad posture vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, is to work to position ourselves to compete and to outcompete with the Chinese uh, across any number of realms. Uh, the readout from last night made very clear uh, 
uh, that the President of the United States, and this also applies to the Secretary of State and to other officials, we will engage the Chinese when it is consistent with our interests, when it is our, when it is our, is in our interests, uh, and consistent with our values. So um, again, I don't want to uh, get into uh, formats or any other upcoming um, uh, engagements, but it is fair to say that. Um, when it is in our interest to uh, cooperate and to work constructively together with Beijing, with the Chinese, uh, we will do that. That will be our North Star, America's interests, uh, America's values, uh, and that will guide our interaction with the Chinese. So there won't be a framework for a continuous dialogue? I wouldn't want to get ahead of where we are. Uh, this was, uh, we are uh, just a few weeks into this administration. Last night, it was the first discussion uh, between President Biden and President Xi. Uh, as you know, Secretary Blinken spoke uh, with Director Yang uh, just uh, less than a week ago. Uh, we are uh, still in the initial stages uh, of our engagement uh, with the Chinese. Um, I would hasten to add that that initial engagement at the level of the Secretary of State and the President of the United States took place um, only after uh, a number of calls uh, with our closest allies and partners. Um, there's a reason why these engagements um, didn't take place on day one. We wanted to make sure uh, that we had coordinated closely uh, with our uh, allies, including our allies in Europe and our treaty allies in the Indo-Pacific, um, but also our partners, uh, including our partners throughout the Indo-Pacific, um, to make clear that our approach to Beijing was uh, known to them, that we um, uh, coordinated on that, uh, and that, again, we positioned ourselves uh, to uh, we positioned ourselves vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China uh, in the strongest possible position. Um, when we talk about our strength uh, in the context of the relationship with China, we derive strength from our values. Uh, we derive strength from our alliances, our partnerships. Uh, but we also derive strength um, from what we do here at home. Uh, and you have heard quite a bit about that from uh, the White House, from the National Security Advisor, but also from the Secretary of State. Uh, we see. Um, uh, our strength as, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as a, uh, uh, our domestic capabilities, our workforce, our education, our technology, um, the steps we take to, pro to protect our supply chains, um, all of that are source, important sources of strength that will propel us, again, to compete and to outcompete with the Chinese um, uh, when we must. And uh, when, it is our, is, when it is in our interest to cooperate with the Chinese, we'll do just that. Base. Can I continue on? Uh, okay, we'll do a couple more on China. Um, May I one sure. more? Um, all right, based on the values that you just mentioned, on the Beijing uh, 2022 Winter Olympics, uh, there's mounting calls for get the games to be moved from China uh, over the human rights, uh, its human rights records. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. Uh, determination that the Beijing government has engaged in genocide against the Uyghurs. Does the U.S. support such call? Well, as you said, these uh, Olympic Games are in 2022, uh, so they're some time away. Um, I think what is true is what I uh, said uh, just prior to that, is that uh, we are consulting closely with our allies and our partners at all levels uh, to define our common concerns and to establish our shared approach to China. Um, I wouldn't want to uh, get ahead of things. We are in uh, early 2021. Uh, we'll have plenty of time to talk about uh, 2022 as uh, in the ensuing months. Uh, China still, Karen? Um, yeah, the, both the Secretary and the President and various briefers have, have said, as you said, that we're willing to cooperate with China when our interests are served by it. And specifically, they have mentioned climate and nonproliferation. I wonder if there are any other issues you foresee where there can be cooperation. Uh, what, where would that kind of cooperation go? What, what do you foresee? And I had another question on Palestine, if you ever get back sure. to that. Well, I think uh, the two you mentioned are uh, strategic uh, areas of cooperation, um, uh, potential areas for cooperation, I should say. Um, it is manifestly in our interest uh, to take on the existential threat of climate change, especially with the numbers, with the world's uh, number two emitter. Um, uh, it's something that uh, is absolutely and profoundly uh, in our interest. Um, uh, uh, and nonproliferation as well. Uh, the world's most dangerous weapons, reducing the risk of uh, nuclear weapons, uh, whether the context is in Russia, um, and we made a very similar point about why we are engaging in a 
uh, five-year extension of New Start, um, but also in the context of China. Um, those are two areas that are in our broad strategic interest. Now, I don't want to rule out that there may be uh, tactical areas of cooperation uh, going forward. Um, but again, our North Star is going to be uh, those interests consistent with our values together uh, with our allies and partners. China. China, yeah. Clarify the decision to withdraw this proposed rule from the Trump administration on universities being uh, required to report con uh, contacts with Confucius Institutes. Yeah. Does does the administration plan to resubmit that rule? And then I just have one more. Sure. Effort. Well, I'm glad you asked because there's been some misreporting um, on that. So l allow me to give just a little bit uh, of background. Um, when it comes to the Confucius Institutes, we have ongoing concerns about um, activities of the CCP, including through these institutes, um, uh, given that they might affect academic freedom in the United States. Um, the State Department, as you know, uh, designated the Confucius Institute U.S. Center as a foreign mission of uh, the PRC, that stands. Um, now, reports asserting that the Biden administration withdrew the draft DHS rule from the Federal Register, that's just not true, it's false. Uh, the Trump administration never submitted it to the Federal Register in the first place uh, because OMB never completed its review of the draft rule during the Trump administration. Uh, it was stuck in OMB's interagency review on Inauguration Day, as we uh, understand it. Um, on that same day, on Inauguration Day, uh, the White House Chief of Staff, Ron Klain, uh, released a memo freezing, freezing all regulatory process uh, very similar to those uh, submitted by his predecessors in that uh, position. Um, that freeze meant that it was withdrawn from uh, the review process um, and would need to uh, be resubmitted. Uh, this withdrawal applied to all other rules uh, that didn't make it through the OMB review prior to uh, the change of administrations. Now, when it comes to this administration, we'll treat Confucius Institutes as part of our overall approach uh, of how best to respond to China's use of information operations and other uh, coercive and corrupting efforts to undermine and interfere in democracies. That's something uh, we will continue to do. So are you saying, would you consider resubmitting this rule? Uh, do you think it's a good idea? We will, as we said, treat the Confucius Institutes uh, as part of our overall approach uh, when it comes to how best to respond to China's use of information operations uh, okay. and other coercive diplomacy. Just one more on, on supply chains and, and um, ties between uh, U.S. companies and Chinese companies. Does the Biden administration broadly support the Trump administration move to put Chinese companies, particularly linked to Xinjiang, on, on the commerce entities list and restrict U.S. companies from doing business with them? Uh, well, we certainly uh, understand, um, and I, I think in the first instance I would need to refer to you to the Department of Commerce um, uh, to speak to these issues uh, in particular. Um, but we certainly understand uh, and have uh, some of the same profound concerns uh, with China's um, predatory uh, behavior when it comes to uh, technology. Uh, it's something we're going to stand up to. Um, it will be part of the review I mentioned uh, as we determine uh, how best to uh, defend ourselves, um, but also to promote our interests and to promote our values in the context of that bilateral relationship more broadly. Uh, uh, we've spent a lot of time over here. Anyone else on China? <laughs> it is. Uh, can you tell us about the, uh, the, about China's decision to um, take the BBC World News off the air, uh, particularly this comes in light of their report on uh, abuses against the, the Uyghur community? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Um, we absolutely condemn uh, the PRC's decision to ban BBC World News. Uh, the PRC maintains one of the most controlled, most oppressive, least free information spaces in the world. Uh, it's troubling that as the PRC restricts outlets and platforms from operating freely in China, Beijing's leaders use free and open media environments overseas uh, to promote misinformation. Uh, we call on the PRC and other nations with authoritarian controls uh, over their population to allow their full access uh, to the internet and media. Uh, media freedom, as we've said, is an important right uh, and it's key to ensuring an informed citizenry, uh, an informed citizenry that can share uh, their ideas freely amongst themselves and with their leaders. So if you're saying that the Chinese 
people should have the same access to misinformation from their leaders as the rest of the world? Is that kind of what, is that kind of what you're saying? We are saying that, and I hope you would agree with this, uh, that free, uh, pluralistic media environments are important the world over, whether that's in China, whether that's in Eastern Europe, uh, whether that's within our own hemisphere. Yes. Can I say a China and Myanmar story? Um, does the U.S. believe that uh, China has been aiding the Myanmar generals who have performed the coup in, in Myanmar? Um, and particularly, are they helping them to regulate the internet and censor um, particular websites? Um, and further, um, yeah, there were some reports that, that the Chinese, Chinese are helping to regulate the internet in Myanmar. You know, is that something that you're expressing concerns about on the call with Xi yesterday? Uh, one, I wouldn't want to contextualize the president's call with his counterpart uh, from here. I would need to uh, defer to the White House to um, offer any augmentation to uh, the, the fairly robust readout that they issued. Uh, but I think the broad point remains, and we've made this point from uh, this podium before, uh, we continue to call on China uh, to condemn uh, the coup that took place in Burma on February 1st. Uh, we would hope and we would expect uh, that the Chinese would play a constructive role in bringing about the restoration of democracy, of civilian rule um, uh, to uh, Burma. Uh, this is, um, it's consistent with, and it's actually uh, a shared interest um, uh, uh, that we have. Um, uh, and so we continue to call on China uh, to do more, um, uh, and we'll continue to do that until China's orientation changes. You don't have specific information on whether they're supporting the generals. You know, do they have a relationship with those generals? And nothing I'm prepared to go into today. Okay. Assistant Secretary um, Sun Kim met with Taiwan's envoy uh, on Wednesday. Do you have a readout on that? Well, I understand that our uh, EAP bureau did uh, issue a tweet uh, that had some uh, details there. Uh, so we don't have any further readout uh, of the meeting with the uh, TECRO uh, representative. Uh, what I can say uh, broadly is that we're committed to deepening ties with Taiwan, uh, given that Taiwan is a leading democracy and a critical economic and security partner. Okay. Can I just Carly? follow up on that? Um, has the Assistant Secretary or Acting Assistant Secretary also met with the Chinese ambassador here? I don't know. We can we can get back to you on that. Okay. Um, and was Secretary Blinken on the phone call between President Trump and President Xi? I mean, sorry, <laughs> President Biden. Maybe he was, if he was on the call with Trump and G, please let us know. I, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't believe he was, but we'll let you know if, if there's information to the contrary. Okay. Can I ask a few more questions? Anything else on China? I have one more. Yep. Um, Since Tuesday, has the U.S. seen the WHO report um, on the, their visit to China? And can the U.S. say whether or not they shared the conclusions that it is unlikely that the virus emanated from a lab? Well, um, we spoke about this uh, a great deal uh, earlier in the week, uh, and um, we said at the time uh, that we note the importance of the ongoing work um, of the international uh, investigation team uh, into uh, the PRC. Uh, the WHO origins inquiry uh, should be granted full, transparent, uh, and complete access required to fully conduct a thorough uh, scientific investigation into the critical question of the origins uh, of COVID-19 wherever it may lead. Uh, I went to great lengths earlier this week to say that we uh, look forward to reviewing the findings, the science, the data ourselves, to marrying uh, what the WHO team uh, has found uh, with what is in our own holdings, uh, including within our intelligence holdings. Uh, so until we're able to do that, uh, until we're able to see the full data, uh, we're going to reserve judgment uh, and we're going to form our conclusions uh, based on the science uh, and the data uh, and those findings. Cuba question, if I may. Okay. A month ago today, in one of its last acts, the, the former administration listed Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism. Can you update it on what is happening? Are you going back to detente with Cuba? Are diplomats going to be going back? Some of the yeah. diplomats that were drawn. Just update us on the Cuba. Well, I think when it comes to Cuba, uh, we have bought with their broad principles at play uh, for our orientation uh, towards 
uh, the country first. Uh, support for democracy and human rights will be at the core of our, of our efforts uh, through empowering uh, the Cuban people to determine their own future. And second, uh, we believe that Americans, and especially Cuban Americans, uh, are the best ambassadors for freedom uh, and prosperity uh, in Cuba. Uh, you've heard me say in this briefing and previous briefings, again, that we are committed to making sure uh, that human rights are a core pillar of foreign policy. Um, we are redoubling our dedication to human rights throughout the hemisphere. Um, and I think that will, again, be a North Star as we uh, review our approach uh, to Cuba going forward. You get a lot of North Stars. Going on. Uh, I, mean, I, th I think of, every time it's I, been it's been interests and values, and interests and values are uh, inextricably linked when it comes to uh, can I follow our, on our human that, rights. On, on Cuba, and this is a very specific question, so if you could if you don't have an answer, I understand, but uh, if you could take it, um, and that is that uh, uh, among um, you probably know that the Cuban government has introduced COVID restrictions requiring. Um, people coming in to the country to quarantine in hotels. Well, Americans and Cuban Americans uh, are not allowed under, or they can, I suppose, but then they're subject to um, treasury penalties to stay in almost all Cuban hotels. Mm -hmm. So uh, as part of the review into the C Cuba policy, is this something that you guys are looking at with an eye toward perhaps doing it more urgently than other uh, than other parts, or are these people who are going in just SOL? Uh, you're right. Uh, let me take that question back. Um, I think that uh, our review of our approach to Cuba is very much uh, ongoing. Um, uh, but let me take that question back and see if we have uh, anything we can uh, we can add. Um, Sean? Uh, Poland. Okay. Um, Polish authorities today announced uh, charges against uh, Martin Lampard, a leading uh, abortion rights activist. Uh, I was wondering if the United States has any comments on this, any comments more generally about the tra trajectory in Poland. Sure. Uh, well, when it comes to uh, these charges, we are aware uh, of the charges against Marta Lempert. Uh, we're watching the situation very closely, uh, promoting, advocating, and defending freedom of speech, the right to peaceful protest, uh, and judicial independence. These are critical to every democracy. Um, Poland is a valued NATO ally. Uh, we consult with regularly uh, on a range of issues. Uh, we are committed to strengthening our partnership with Poland and advancing uh, the administration's commitments to supporting uh, democratic institutions, human rights, uh, and uh, the rule of law. Um, I, of course, the charges today, I think, are part and parcel of a constricting uh, space for civil society um, within Poland. Uh, so we do have um, uh, broader concerns, including the proposed uh, media tax uh, that uh, has been unveiled uh, recently. Uh, as well, uh, as I was saying, um, in the context of a very different um, media uh, crackdown, we're committed to supporting a diversity of independent media voices and opinions, uh, which we believe are essential uh, to vibrant democracies. Yes. Uh, on or on, uh, Michael Crowley, good to see oh, you. Oh, yeah. Hi. Didn't recognize you by the time. Yeah, behind the, behind the mask. The mask. Yeah. Um, President Obama used to say before the JCPOA uh, that it was unacceptable for Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon explicitly ruled out containment of a nuclear Iran as a policy option and reserved all options to prevent Iran from obtaining a bomb. Uh, is it, uh, does this administration view it as unacceptable for Iran to obtain a nuclear weapon? President Biden, candidate Biden, they have been very clear. Uh, our policy Same will, <laughs> as a candidate and as president, uh, Joe Biden uh, has been very clear. Uh, we will not countenance um, uh, a nuclear-armed Iran. Um, uh, our approach, um, and as we have talked about, um, uh, uh, we are um, pursuing a diplomatic one, um, will be to ensure that Iran can never acquire a nuclear weapon. Uh, that was at the crux of the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, it will um, be a guiding principle of our approach uh, towards uh, this challenge. Uh, there, um, uh, uh, period. Uh, we've got on Iran one last question. I know we've gone on for a long time. Thank you. Um, you've been saying from the beginning of the podium about Iran that your um, the administration is consulting with friends, partners, allies, and Congress on how to approach this issue, the nuclear issue, and the agreement. 
Now, Iran just announced that they're going to have uh, their presidential elections in June. The West considers the present Iranian president as moderate. And there's a lot of talk about hardliners possibly being in the pool for the next presidential race. What is the administration uh, looking at as, as its approach to Iran, uh, whether you're thinking about right now dealing with so-called ro moderate Rouhani or a, a what, what is it an overall comprehensive approach that you're looking at that uh, irrespective of who is the president and his approach? Mm -hmm. I think uh, we aren't looking at it in those terms. Uh, we are looking at it through the lens of our national security, um, of the security of our partners and allies in the region. Uh, and that's why, in response to Michael's question, I was very clear uh, that um, our policy, the president's policy, um, uh, uh, at its core, uh, is an understanding that Iran uh, cannot be allowed to develop a nuclear weapon. Uh, so, um, regardless of the constellation of actors, uh, that will continue to be uh, a core principle for us. It's precisely why the president has put forward the formulation that is now very familiar to everyone in this room. Uh, if Iran resumes its full compliance uh, with the 2015 nuclear deal, uh, we'll do the same. Uh, we'll seek to lengthen and strengthen uh, the provisions of that deal. We'll use it as a platform uh, to build uh, and to negotiate follow-on agreements to address other areas of Iran's malign uh, activity. That will be our approach. Uh, I don't think we are going to uh, let developments um, uh, elsewhere um, dictate uh, any changes to that approach. Thank, Thank you. you very much, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.